This is my first video update coming to you from Athens, Greece. I am now currently at the hill of Muses Philopapos, and this is a hill right across the way from the Acropolis. And this this hill right here was actually used, and you can see the the monument right up there. This hill was actually um, used as uh, as fortification for the Athenians, or so the legend goes, for the Athenians to uh, to battle invaders. And specifically, this hill was uh, where there was a battle with the Athenians and um, the Amazons. This is according to myth, to myth, but. Uh, you can see the Acropolis ride across the way. And this is where the battle with the Amazons allegedly took place. But uh, this is a, a great place to come to if you are visiting uh, Athens. It's, uh, it's right across from the Acropolis. No, uh, no entrance fee, nothing. You just walk up here and you explore this area. And it's really interesting because you have the monuments right here. You have a great view of the Acropolis. And at the foot of this hill, you have some uh, Byzantine churches as well. So it's an interesting spot. And I thought this would be a good place to come to. And uh, we could do a video and talk about the news. And uh, the first story that we need to get to and there's a lot of important uh, topics that we need to cover. But the first topic that, uh, that I want to talk about is European Foreign Minister Joseph Burrell and the comments that he made the other day when uh, he was giving an interview to, I believe, El País, Spanish uh, mainstream media news outlet. It's really sunny here, so I'm going to have a hard time reading a lot of the, the sites that I've got flagged here. But uh, we'll get through. We'll figure out a way to get through this. I believe it was El País. Yes, El País. So he gave an interview on Thursday. And uh, Burrell said, We are at war. <laughs> I love how they use we. He said, we must explain to our citizens that this is not someone else is war. The public must be willing to pay the price of supporting Ukraine and for preserving the unity of the EU. We are at war. These things are not free. He added, acknowledging that the cost should be distributed, should be distributed equitably. <laughs> Does that mean if uh, we distribute the cost equitably, Burrell and all of his buddies are going to go to the front lines of Ukraine and fight the, uh, the Russians. Is that what he means by uh, having it distributed equitably? I love how they just throw all of us in there, all the EU citizens. We, we are at war. And we're just going to have to, you know, all of us are going to have to pay the price, right? Not them, not the EU, uh, technocrats and kleptocrats, everyone else. Everyone else is just going to have to pay that price for EU unity. Even though Ukraine is not a member of the EU, nor are they a member of NATO. Ursula van der Crazy fast-tracked them to become a candidate country, even though they fulfill absolutely zero of the requirements to become a candidate country of the European Union. And uh, I'm, I'm not being mean to Ukraine. Greece doesn't fulfill any of those requirements either. And we're a member of the European Union. So, you know, go figure. But as the EU has gone along, as they have progressed, they, very, they have very much become a will take anybody kind of club. And so, you know, they're, they're now taking Ukraine in. But um, here you go. The Hill of Muses, Philopapos. get up close here so everyone can see it Opa. All right. hope you guys can see it let's go right through the gate here all right there we go Okay. All 
right, so let's, uh, there you have a good view of the Acropolis. Let's get down from here. If you do come here, bring, uh, bring some good walking shoes because uh, it's rocky. All right, so Burrell, we are at war, everybody. All the EU citizens, I just want you to know that according to Burrell, we're all at war and we have to be at war in order to, uh, to preserve EU values. And we're all going to pay a price, by the way, all of us. Uh, even, even countries that are not in the EU, the US, the UK, from what I understand, UK uh, energy prices are going to hit something like 5,000 pounds a year. That's going to be the expected bill that an average citizen in the UK is going to pay for their energy bills. But don't, you know, don't worry, everyone. According to Burrell, it's all worth it. This is all worth it because we have to preserve those EU values. <laughs> those EU values that we're always going to war over. You know, the values like locking up Assange and, uh, and stuff like that. You know, raiding banks, bail-ins, energy, energy blackouts, rolling blackouts, austerity. What else? Uh, banning Russians from traveling to, <laughs> to Schengen member states. Discrimination, bigotry, racism. Those are the EU values that we're talking about. Libya, Syria. <laughs> Supporting Azov, we are at war. So <laughs> um, let's uh, let's discuss the push for war from the European Union and NATO, and uh, we have some really troubling news coming out of uh, of Finland. Let me show you the trail right down here. So Finland and Estonia, actually, so this is more so, this is more so Estonia than Finland. The, uh, the Estonian, I'm going to have to pull this up. I believe the Estonian uh, defense minister. One minute. Hmm, hmm, hmm. I'm forgetting all these names and all these people who are involved in all of these these crazy ideas. Ah, here we go. Yes, the Estonian Defense Minister. So the Estonian Defense Minister is now saying that uh, Finland and, has, and Estonia are going to work together to secure the, uh, the Baltic Sea. They're gonna work together to secure the Baltic Sea and make it into a NATO lake. They're gonna turn it into a de facto NATO lake. And they're gonna do this according to the Estonian defense minister because according to him, Esto uh, Finland already has missiles that can reach across the um the gulf of finland and can can cover the distance to estonia and estonia is going to be purchasing israeli missiles which will have a range of 300 kilometers which will also uh be able to to reach over towards finland which would mean that uh they will have enough missiles to secure the uh the gulf of finland and that's going to de facto turn the Baltic into a NATO sea. A NATO internal sea are the exact words that he uses. We need to integrate our coastal defenses. The flight range of Estonian and Finnish missiles is greater than the width of the Gulf of Finland. Finland's MTO-85M coastal missiles have a range of over 100 kilometers. The Gulf is about 82 kilometers across from Helsinki to Tallinn, Estonia plans to buy itself Israeli Luspear missiles later this year, which have a range of almost 300 kilometers. 
The Baltic Sea will be NATO's internal sea when Finland and Sweden have joined NATO. Compared with what it is today, the situation is changing. This is according to Beth Gur, who is the defense minister. He added that the two countries will then be able to close the sea to the Russian Navy if need be. Estonian defense minister Beth Gur, trying to look for his name here. Ah, here we go. Hanno Pefkor, this is what he told the Finnish newspaper Ital Italehti. Okay. Um, a Baltic, let's see which way should we go here. Turn it into a Baltic Sea, huh? Turn it into a NATO Sea. Turn the Baltic Sea into a NATO lake. That's what the defense minister is saying. And he's going to lock out the Russian Navy. Yeah, I don't, <laughs> I don't think Russia is going to allow that, Mr. Estonian Defense Minister. And, you know, I find it funny that, uh, that he's throwing Finland into this, uh, into the mix here. And he's saying that Estonia is working with Finland to create this, uh, this NATO lake. And so if any Russian ship decide to cross the Gulf of Finland, then uh, he is implying that Estonia or Finland will shoot at that uh, that Russian Navy ship, which would essentially just mean World War III, right? I mean, Finland isn't even in NATO yet, and they're already threatening World War III. I mean, they haven't even gotten the okay from Turkey. <laughs> Turkey hasn't even given them the okay. And right now, the best thing that Turkey can do and that Erdogan can do in order to save the world and save the planet is to just vote Finland and Sweden down. I mean, Erdogan would be actually saving the world from, uh, from a World War III type of scenario. But uh, I remember the Finnish prime minister, when they were talking about Finland entering NATO, she came out with statements saying, oh, NATO is just a defensive organization and we're not going to host any... Uh, any NATO bases and we're not going to have NATO forces that are going to threaten Russia on Finnish soil. And like two months later, we now have supposedly, allegedly from the defense minister of Estonia claiming that the two countries, Finland and Estonia, are already talking about shooting, uh, shooting at Russian Navy ships that dare to, to enter the, uh, the Baltic Sea. Well, at least if Liz Truss becomes prime minister, she's going to actually think that maybe Estonia and Finland are talking about the Black Sea because she always confuses the two. <laughs> so at least at least the UK, if they get Liz Truss as prime minister, she's not going to have a clue as to what uh, Finland and Estonia are talking about with regards to closing off the Gulf of Finland and the uh, Baltic Sea from the Russian Navy. But either way, this is something that the Russians will never put up with and uh, Finland, well, Finland is just setting themselves up for complete annihilation with this type of, uh, of rhetoric. And let's just hope it remains as such, just rhetoric. But uh, Estonia, you know, Estonia has kind of displayed that they're, that they're crazy enough to implement these types of uh, policies. You know, they're the ones that have implemented the travel ban on, on Russians carrying an Estonian Schengen. So, you know, I bet you if Finland okayed this, Estonia would be like, yeah, let's do it. And, uh, well, yeah, it would be lights out for all of us in, in Europe, wouldn't it? There's no way in hell the Russians would put up with this. No way in hell. But, uh, you know, NATO... They're, uh, they're itching for conflict. NATO is, is trying to set up. In the next two or three years, it seems like they're trying to set up all the dynamics for some sort of, uh, of World War III conflict. You have the other Baltic states um, joining Lithuania, Estonia once again, and Latvia. They are joining Lithuania in... Uh, in lashing out at China. Actually, they're pulling out of a cooperation they had with China. It was called the 16 plus one. 
And it was a cooperation between European countries, mostly Southern and Central European countries with China. And they were cooperating on investment and infrastructure and stuff like this. But uh, Lithuania has pulled out of that because Lithuania has been provoking China for the better part of uh, one to two years now. And now you have Estonia and Latvia following Lithuania's lead and they're, they've pulled out of the 16 plus one cooperation with China, citing China's uh, provocative actions towards Taiwan and its support of Russia and not uh, sanctioning Russia. So the 16 plus one has now turned into the 14 plus one because the Baltic nations, two more Baltic nations have left the uh, cooperation. And the countries that are involved in the 14 plus one now are countries like, uh, I think like Greece and Croatia and Slovakia. And uh, there's, some more, there's some more countries in Central and Southern Europe that are still cooperating with China. But uh, the Baltic nations are now gone. Poland, Romania, Czech Republic, Hungary, Slovenia, Slovakia. So they're still in the uh, in the 14 plus one now cooperation with China. But those Baltic nations, <laughs> they're really causing trouble, aren't they? The U.S. is really happy about this. According to uh, the U.S. State Department spokes spokesman Vedat Patel, we respect and support Estonia and Latvia's sovereign decision to no longer participate in the 16 plus one initiative. According to Patel, strengthening ties with partners in Europe are a pillar of the U.S. administration's approach to Beijing. In other words, they're, uh, they're using... They're using the Baltic nations to stir up conflict. So let's take a look at this small... All right. So, uh, whew, it is hot. It was hot up there. China's not, uh, China's not sitting around doing nothing, by the way, as, as uh, NATO and the U.S. are, are using the Baltic states to, to make all these moves. And uh, they're also making moves. And one of the moves that they're making is uh, getting Saudi Arabia on side. <laughs> now, that would be big. So Xi Jinping is scheduled to travel to Riyadh, I believe, next week. To meet with uh, with MBS, and we all know how MBS's meeting with Biden went. Well, Xi Jinping is ready to to meet with uh, with the Saudi prince and de facto ruler of Saudi Arabia, and you know that they're going to talk about de-dollarization. This is Xi's first trip to uh, Saudi Arabia in three years, and. Uh, I am absolutely positive that he will be very welcomed by the uh, by the Saudis. Unlike Biden, Xi will be given the VIP treatment while he's in Saudi Arabia, and I'm positive that they're going to close a lot of big deals. And I'm sure that those deals will be outside of the uh, the USD. So more de-dollarization on the way. Let's uh, 
what else should we talk about here? I am kind of beat. <laughs> I am kind of exhausted. Let's see. Uh, <laughs> The Washington Post. The Washington Post is now admitting that um, there is no Kherson counteroffensive. They've just come out and admitted it. They're saying on the Kherson front lines, there is little sign of a Ukrainian offensive. Waiting on weapons deliveries, Ukrainian gains on the ground have stalled. <laughs> Ukrainian gains on the ground have stalled. They really do have good script writers there at the Washington Post. There is little sign that a major counteroffensive is brewing, according to the Washington Post. They're saying that Russia has significantly increased the artillery along the entire line and that Ukraine is lacking from basic artillery and armored vehicles needed to progress. Ukraine has focused, focused on operations far behind the front line as Ukraine doesn't have a sufficient number of weapon systems for a counteroffensive. The Washington Post is also claiming that Ukraine was behind the mysterious attack in Crimea, even though the Ukrainian government has not taken credit for the uh, the attack. The Washington Post is taking credit for them because you got to keep the propaganda rolling. You got to keep it rolling. And uh, Alensky, for his part, he gave a statement yesterday. And let me read you. Let's walk down a little. Let me read you what Alensky said during his nightly statement. This is after Alensky is done partying it up and, and getting some of that, that white sugary stuff in his system. <laughs> that white sugary looking stuff in his system. He gets on the TV and he, uh, he puts on his best green army shirt. Gets on the TV and, and addresses the Ukrainian people. And uh, a lot of this is meant for Western media consumption, and a lot of it is, is done in order to, to sell weapons. But uh, this is what Alensky said in his nightly address. After everything that the occupiers have done in Ukraine, there can only be one attitude towards Russia, a terrorist state. It is from this point of view that one should decide on the attitude towards the citizens of Russia. I think the Czech Republic, the Baltic states, and other countries that have officially taken the discussion in Europe on the issue of visas for citizens of a terrorist state, we must not destroy the very idea of Europe, our common European values. You can't turn Europe into a supermarket where it doesn't matter who comes in. And the main thing is that a person simply pays for the goods Therefore, visa restrictions for Russian citizens are fair. All defenders of European values must insist on them. Interesting choice of words from, uh, from the European champion, Elensky. You can't turn Europe into a supermarket where it doesn't matter who comes in. So I guess Elensky would be against all of the, the immigration into Europe, right? I mean, he is a defender of European values, even though Ukraine is not a part of the European Union, <laughs> but he is the defender of European values. And according to King Alensky, you just can't have people walk into the supermarket, pay for goods, and then leave. <laughs> is, is, is that, are those the European values that we're talking about? <laughs> oh, man. They're all twisted in a pretzel, all of these Davos, globalist, clown puppet actor, elites. And I'm not saying that Alensky is an elite, but he's definitely a clown puppet actor. But uh, yeah, so he's a defender of EU values now. And of course, he continues to push for the Russian travel ban. It looks like uh, Czech Republic is on board with that, as are all the Baltic states now. Uh, Germany came out the other day and said that they're not on board with that initiative. But Olaf Scholz is a weakling and he's a pushover and he holds no power for, uh, for Germany or in the European Union. So who cares what Olaf Scholz thinks or says or does? He's an absolute lightweight. And so 
you know, if you have more and more countries kind of buying into Alensky is the defender of EU values and we shouldn't treat the European Union like a supermarket allowing anybody to come in, then I imagine there's not going to only be a travel ban for uh, Russians, but there'll be a travel ban for, uh, for everybody, <laughs> right? You can't treat the EU like a supermarket after all, says the, uh, says the puppet leader of a country that's not in the EU and never will be in the EU. There probably won't even be an EU by the time uh, Ukraine actually possibly ever starts a session talks with the European Union. <laughs> I don't think the EU is going to last 20 or 30 years at this rate. Once the Schengen fall, it falls apart. And as, uh, as we have two or three very, very cold, difficult winters, I don't think the EU will be around that long. But uh, I mean, in London right now, which is not part of the EU, but in London, they're rationing water. <laughs> That's how bad things are getting around Europe in general. They're rationing bottled water. And the Telegraph is actually reporting at an Aldi supermarket um, imposing bottled water rationing. That's right. You can only buy five single bottles of three Five single bottles and three multi-packs per person, according to the Telegraph of Water. And this is happening in France as well. And all across the European Union, you have all these types of uh, food rationing, water rationing, energy rationing is coming. But just keep on following Alensky, EU. Remember what Borrell said, we're at war. So we're going to have to pay the price of, of all of this because we're at war. We, all of us. <laughs> Not Burrell. <laughs> when Burrell says we, he means you. <laughs> You're at war. Burrell's going to be flying on private jets like Hunter and, and Joe Biden did the other day as they traveled to, uh, to, their, to their vacation home, something like a $20 million estate. Hunter, Hunter and Joe together traveling, father and son, because we are at war. Or how Justin Trudeau traveled to, uh, where did he go? Costa Rica? Because <laughs> we are at war. According to Burrell, us, not them, us. Ah, uh, all right. What else do I have <laughs> here? Let's see. Let's talk a little bit about Africa. And let's do an update here about Africa. And I'm now at the foot of the Acropolis. And I'll get to the, uh, I'll walk up this way. To the Erodio. <laughs> It here. So let's walk up. It's some more heat. Let's walk up towards the Erodio. We'll wrap up the video from there as we talk about Africa and we'll do a very quick clown world, which I believe highlights the decay of, uh, of Europe, the UK, but you know, of Europe in general. So, um, in South Africa, Lincoln, when he was recently doing his South Africa, I can one up Lavrov tour, which is what it was because the State Department before Blinken went to Africa specifically said that this trip by the Secretary of State to South Africa and uh, other countries in Africa is specifically designed in order to counter Russia and to try and convince South Africa into placing sanctions on Russia and ditching the BRICS and moving into the uh, collective West camp. That's what the State Department said in all of their communiques. Well, Blinken gave a press conference with the uh, South African uh, foreign minister, but I believe the title is the uh, Minister of Internal International Relations. And uh, I believe her name is uh, P Pandor. One sec, let me see. I do believe that her name is Pandor. Yes, Naledi Pandor, and it is the Minister of International Relations. So that's like the, the foreign ministry. She's like the foreign minister, um, Blinken's counterpart or Lavrov's counterpart. And uh, they gave a press conference and uh, you got to hand it to Pandor. She was brilliant. So Blinken, during the press conference, he tried to walk back 
the uh, the initial statements from the State Department, from his office, saying that they're in Africa in order to influence South Africa to ditch Russia. And Blinken said, no, 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 that's not why we're in South Africa. He said, our commitment to a stronger partnership with Africa is not about trying to outdo anyone else. So Blinken, throughout the whole press conference with Pandora, was trying to make the claim that he's not in South Africa to one-up Lavrov because he got super jealous that... Uh, when Lavrov visited Africa, all the leaders wanted to take photos with him and wanted to shake his hand. And uh, they wanted to do business with Lavrov and they just wanted to be associated with a, with a rock star, a professional diplomat and a winner. And that really pissed off Blinken. But uh, now Blinken is coming out with statements. During this press conference, he came out with statements saying, no, no, that's not why I'm in uh, South Africa. I'm actually in South Africa to, to just build on a stronger relationship. And this is not about, this is not about uh, forcing South Africa to choose between us or, or Russia. That was his statement. Now, Pandora, she was absolutely brilliant because... She came out with a statement and she said that uh, certain countries, and she said, not Blinken, no, 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 never Blinken, but certain other hegemons and other world leaders try to bully South Africa and try to threaten South Africa to move away from Russia. <laughs> and she said that South Africa is not going to put up with any type of bullying. She said that South Africa is a sovereign nation with a sovereign foreign policy. And... Uh, its relations with Russia are excellent and it's not going to put up with any type of bullying, even if that bullying is coming from bigger, more powerful nations. And of course, Pandora was, she was brilliant because as she was making this statement, she kept on saying, but not Blinken. Blinken never bullied us. <laughs> but, you know, other people that were trying to bully us. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> let me just get it here. And so that was a brilliant statement from the South African, uh, what would be the South African foreign minister during that press statement? Now, the UN ambassador, um, what's uh, Linda Thomas Greenfield? And uh, but by the way, this is, as you can see here, this is the theater, and they still actually have plays and productions. They actually have concerts and theaters take place in the ancient Erodio, which is the, uh, the Athens, the Acropolis. Uh, theater and they still have concerts and stuff uh, you can't really see in it's a shame one day I'll take everyone up there and you'll see down below at the theater and uh, they're, they're having productions all throughout the summer so you can buy tickets and go to an event here actually a long long time ago I saw Sting play here Sting from the police he gave a concert here and they you know this is like 15 years ago and it was it was cool but uh linda thomas greenfield so she did an african tour and she went to uh, ghana she went to cape verde and uh where else did she go ghana cape verde i want to say mozambique but i don't think so let me see here she was in Ah, Uganda. Yes. So she went, she did an African tour and she went to these three countries and uh, she threatened these three countries. She said, our sanctions against Russia are intended to discourage the Russians from continuing their aggression in Ukraine. I would caution African countries not to engage with countries sanctioned by the United States. I would caution African countries not to engage with countries sanctioned by the United States. You caution them to not engage with Russia because the U.S. will do what if these countries engage with Russia? So Blinken, on the one hand, is coming out with statements now saying, no, 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 we're... We said we were going to come to Africa in order to influence South Africa to move away from Russia. But that's not why we're really here. We're just here to strengthen our relationship. And then the U.N. ambassador of the United States comes to uh, 
to Africa. And she says, no, 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 no. We're actually here to caution African countries not to make any deals with Russia or else, or else something bad. In other words, sanctions or something like that is going to happen. So that was a statement from the American UN ambassador, Roman Cistern. Roman Cistern. Romaiki Vixamini. So that was the news coming from an African trip from Blinken and from the UN ambassador, the US ambassador to the United Nations and her trip to Africa. And let's wrap this video up and we'll do it with a very, very quick clown world. And in this clown world, we are just gonna talk about, since we're talking about theaters, and we were at the Erodio. Let's talk about the Globe Theater in London, the historic Shakespeare Globe Theater, which doesn't particularly like Shakespeare and has gone all woke. And they're coming out with a production of, uh, of Joan of Arc. And uh, in this production of Joan of Arc, the, uh, the French heroine and, and saint will be portrayed as gender neutral. Gen gender neutral. Rebelling against the world's expectations, questioning the gender binary, Joan finds their power and their belief spreads like fire, according to the website of this production. According to the theater, its portrayal of Joan of Arc, who led the French resistance against the English invaders, in the 15th century, but ended up being captured and burnt at the stake, will be alive, queer, and full of hope. That is a quote. Our new play, I, Joan, shows Joan as a legendary leader who uses the pronouns they, them. We are not the first to present Joan in this way, and we will not be the last. We can't wait to share this production with everyone and discover this cultural icon. <laughs> oh boy <laughs> no comment no comment everybody I'm not going to say anything about this clown world I think that uh, that tweet said it all <laughs> I'm signing out to the Duran.locals.com uh, check out Alexander's channel check out the Duran's channel and uh, <laughs> Rumble Odyssey bitch shoot and telegram the duran.locals.com i think i already said that coming to you from the metropolis area i am signing out take care